Well, I've given lots of talks around the world, but I'll tell you, it's a bit intimidating to be talking in front of an audience full of your friends, neighbors, <laughs> the architect who designed our house 100 years ago. Uh, so thank you, community, for, uh, for, for showing up. This is absolutely terrific. The BioFrontiers Institute was established to knock down walls. So the walls that I'm talking about are the walls of the traditional s disciplines, chemistry, physics, biology, geology, computer science, math. These departmental affiliations served the university so well in the last century as a way of organizing our teaching and our research. But as time went on, and many of the problems that uh, we face scientifically and that frankly we face as humans are best solved not by individual disciplines, but by asking questions and then just taking all the disciplines that can try to answer that question and bringing them together. So that's what BioFrontiers is about. That's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about a different wall, the wall that we as scientists have set up between ourselves and all of you. And that's another wall that we need to break down because it is not productive for any of us. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about what the editor of Science Magazine had to say about this. And I could have, there are a hundred such editorials that have been written. So here's just one that happens to be a rather recent one that we need to learn how to speak out against anti-science without seeming condescending. And this is a problem that the scientific community has not cracked. We need to look for new ways, da da da, um, because we want to broaden everybody's understanding of science, humanity's involving attempt to discover how the world works and how a deep understanding of nature can be harnessed to benefit everyone, regardless of political persuasion. And this is something that is so discouraging to us that a lot of issues that have to do with the environment, that have to do with people's health, public health, that are just human issues have become politicized. And that's a failure of, of us and that's something that we have to work on. So another more specific event that has caused me to want to spend considerable effort on public science uh, uh, explanations had to do with the pandemic, where I think we did a terrible job of rolling out the vaccines. We told people what they had to do, and Americans don't respond very well to that. I think they like to be engaged in the decision-making process. And some of this data, which is the most recent that I can find, shows that uh, we not only were very low compared to other countries that have similar demographics. I mean, you visit Canada and Australia, they don't seem that different from us, right? And yet, they had much higher vaccination rates, much more acceptance of science and belief in science. And some of these other countries were below Brazil, Botswana, and India, where access to vaccines is a major problem, which we don't have here. So, so you know, clearly we have some, some, some work to do. So we need to speak out and engage the public in what we are doing as scientists. And why is it so hard for us to do this? And I think the answer is pretty clear. It all has to do with jargon. And jargon is not a bad thing. I can walk into the laboratory and I can say, why don't we CRISPR that mutation into the endogenous locus in hex 293 cells? And the student immediately knows, it would take me two days to explain that to any of you, but the student immediately knows what that means. So jargon is a wonderful shorthand, and it's, many of you in your own discipline use a lot of jargon too, right? That, that facilitates conversations in a very, um, rapid and accurate way. But of course, that same jargon that helps us in the lab gets in the way 
of us talking to the general public. And so one of my projects to try to uh, surmount this has been to write a book. It's not out yet. It's called The Catalyst. You may notice the similarity to the title of the talk today. And this is my attempt to bring RNA science and RNA medicine to the general public. And I thought I would have an easy time writing this because I have taught a couple of thousand freshman undergraduates at CU Boulder in chemistry. And I know how to make things, I thought, clear and simple. But it turns out that high sc school students learn a lot of science, AP courses, so when they come to college, they've had science recently. But their parents, many of you, or maybe their grandparents, right, it's been a long time since you've been in a science class. So it turned out to be very difficult to write for this more general audience, and we'll see after it comes out <laughs> to the extent to which I've been successful. Now, when you're talking about RNA, you know, people say, well, that's probably somewhat like DNA, right? Ribonucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid. And people are comfortable with DNA. They know that, you know, it's responsible for inherited traits. You can use it to trace your family history. You can use it to find uh, genetic diseases, solve crimes uh, in, in forensics. But as soon as you go to RNA, they say, oh, that's much too complicated. But RNA is just a single strand of DNA. Right? It's the same thing, but it's just one strand instead of a double helix. And the bits of information along that DNA, A's, G's, C's, and T's are the four bits of information, are just copied verbatim into RNA. It's A, G, C, and U, but U is just has a little chemical widget compared to T, so it has the same coding capacity. So it's really the informational content is identical, but the fact that it's single-stranded, as you will see, is actually gives it a lot more power than DNA has. Now the other thing that makes it easier to start the conversations about RNA now after the pandemic is that at least everyone's heard the, the three-letter words, or the four letters, mRNA, right? So the mRNA vaccines have messenger RNA encapsulated in a greasy ball, which we'll talk about uh, the function of that lipid nanoparticle in a minute. Oops, I used jargon, see? <laughs> lipid nanoparticles, it's hard to get away from this, right? And this is a, about the same size as the coronavirus, which itself has genetic information as RNA. It doesn't even know anything about DNA. It's enough for it to have a genome a coding array made out of ribonucleic acid. So RNA is pretty powerful. But the thing that hurts us in talking about RNA to the general public is that a lot of social media and um, magazine articles and books talk about RNA as a medicine, RNA, mRNA as a drug. And that frightens people. And yeah, it is a, you know, a medicine and it is a uh, a drug, a very successful vaccine, but it's also natural. It's in every cell in our body, and it's in all the food that we eat, whether we're vegan or vegetarian or, or meat eaters or whatever. In fact, in Boulder, we would even say it's organic, <laughs> right? So, so how does it work? And this was figured out in the decade after Watson and Crick determined the structure of the DNA double helix. Because they knew that this must be the informational molecule, but how that DNA bits of information would encode the amino acids in the proteins that are the enzymes and the muscles and the signaling molecules and the insulin and the antibodies, the sort of movers and shakers in, in biology, there had to be some kind of a code and it was unknown, but it was such an important question, so fundamental to how biology works, that uh, there was a huge uh, international effort to determine that code. And within about a decade, it was, it was solved. It was not easy to do this. So again, the question was, 
The DNA, again, is copied into the exact replica in a single-stranded RNA, and then somehow this order of the A's, G's, C's, and U has to determine the order of the amino acids that are joined together in a protein molecule. So had there been a Rosetta Stone, it would have been easy, right? So the Rosetta Stone has the uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics and the same text written in Greek. So had there been a Rosetta Stone that had a sentence written in the language of RNA and then another sentence written in the language of protein, it would have been, it would have been trivial. But it turns out that there wasn't, so experiments had to be done. And it turned out that the code was a triplet code, and that groups of three building blocks along the mRNA specified particular amino acids. And again, the jargon keeps slipping in there. This is another word for protein. But you're all comfortable with the word protein, and these people use the word polypeptide. And I didn't know how to, my IT skills aren't very good, so I didn't know how to fix that. So anyway, um, so very soon the whole table of codons to translate the mRNA bits of information into the amino acid code was determined. And this is just one of the great, you know, uh, achievements of humanity to, to, f to figure this out. So now if you have a, a protein that you want to make, such as, we'll get to this in a minute, the coronavirus spike protein, which needs to be used to make the, the vaccines, and you want to know what kind of mRNA to make to encode that spike protein, you just look it up in the table. And this is any undergraduate taking a fundamental biology course at CU can, can just make that um, uh, change very, very easily. So if you want to then make that spike protein to use as a, uh, for vaccination, you could use the DNA to mRNA to protein uh, series of transformations that I've been talking about. But what the clever folks at BioNTech in Mainz, Germany, and in Moderna in Cambridge, Massachusetts, realized was that they could take a shortcut. You don't need DNA, because RNA has the same information content. So they just said, let's just go from mRNA and shoot that into people's arms, and then the human body will translate that mRNA code into the spike protein. And why is it the spike protein that you need for vaccination? Because you want your immune system to be on the lookout, and it has to be on the lookout for the first thing it's going to see, which of course is the exterior of the virus, and that's coded with these this corona, crown-like, 90 spikes of the spike protein per, per virus. And this uh, then will cause the immune system to produce B cells, that, which are uh, cells in the bone marrow, that make antibodies, which specifically will bind to that spike protein and prevent it from docking to our uh, human cells and infecting them, or T cells, which are on the lookout for cells that are infected by that virus and will go about attacking them and, and killing them. So that's why we need to present the spike protein uh, in, the, in the vaccination, and the mRNA is an indirect way of doing that. Now, an interesting achievement, or a spectacular, I'm sorry, interesting, a spectacular achievement, was uh, to do all of this within a year. So there had been zero mRNA vaccines ever approved before 2020. So how is it possible that the first one could be produced so quickly, especially considering that it takes eight to 10 years is the typical time for development of a new vaccine? And part of the answer is that the uh, industrial process doubled up on a lot of processes that normally would have to occur sequentially. You wouldn't start the next blue bar until you'd finished the last one, and they overlap these to speed up the development time. But more critically, it was really because taxpayers' dollars had funded 
research into what RNA was and how it worked for decades before there was any known SARS-CoV-2, no coronavirus, and they, this was funded independent of any applications. Just let's figure out the nuts and bolts about how biology works, and this is an important human endeavor, and it'll probably be really useful at some time. So the sort of like thinking about this as a jigsaw puzzle, scientists had already crafted all of the individual pieces, and they were lying out on the table, and the vaccine makers st still had a daunting job to put the puzzle together, but at least the pieces were already there. So there were a number of challenges with the mRNA vaccines that this basic science had to uh, be able to uh, solve, and one is that RNA is not very stable. All of the tissues in our body have enzymes whose job it is to break down or cut up RNA molecules. Well, that's part of normal biology, but it's bad if you're trying to make an mRNA vaccine to, uh, to survive. RNA does not get into cells, uh, human cells, by itself, and RNA also triggers a nasty inflammatory response, and that's because any RNA you put into a person, the person says, oh, maybe that's a viral RNA. So we have a system in our bodies that's on the lookout for anything that could be viral, and RNA is certainly uh, um, a, so a possible sign of a virus. So these were the challenges that were met by this um, fundamental scientific research over the decades, including the stability problem being solved by uh, wrapping the RNA in these little grease balls called lipid nanoparticles. The same lipid nanoparticles help RNA get into cells, as shown in the diagram here. So think about, think about a bowl of chicken noodle soup, and think about the little islands of fat on top of them, and what happens when two of them collide? They form a bigger island of fat, right? And so that's similar to the way that these lipid nanoparticles with these greasy exteriors fuse with the cellular membranes in order to get the RNA inside of the cells. And scientists all over the world contributed to these findings, including a couple at CU Boulder. And my colleague Marv Carruthers invented uh, how to make uh, specific little strings of DNA which are technically called oligo, which means a few nucleotides, which are the building blocks along DNA. And these are absolutely essential for sequencing either RNA or DNA. So this, these were essential for figuring out what the uh, coronavirus sequence was that encoded the spike protein. And uh, also, they're critical for the PCR reaction that you, many of you use to get tested. You need these oligonucleotides to do a, a PCR test for a virus as well. And then my other colleague, Aki Uhlenbeck, helped develop this um, in vitro transcription. Okay, sorry, jargon again. But in vitro is Latin for what? In glass, and we don't use glass anymore. We use plastic now, but we still call it in vitro. And then uh, transcription means to, well, just like the ancient um, um, monks would copy script onto, uh, you know, papyrus or whatever. I'm, I'm, that's not my field, sorry. Um, but, uh, you know, they would transcribe it from one to another, and that's, what, that's the process of going from DNA to RNA. And so he, helped, he was one of several scientists who helped develop this as a robust technology. And it's the same method that Moderna and BioNTech then used to make the mRNA. So uh, what we found was that there were some uh, real great um, advantages of these mRNA vaccines that maybe hadn't been completely predicted. One is that uh, they're very adaptable. So as the virus mutates and changes, any undergraduate in any of our labs at BioFrontiers could design a new vaccine within a couple of days. It's just that easy because you've got that coat on table, right? And so you just know, if you ch have changes in the amino acid, you know how to make the new, the new vaccine sequence. It takes then a while for the uh, uh, FDA and the, the safety authorities to approve it. That's the slow step, but at least the design is quick. 
And you can also um, save a million chicken eggs per year. And that's not an exaggeration. There are actually one million chicken eggs used in the United States alone to make each year to make the flu vaccine. Okay? And they are hand injected with an incapacitated virus. So not only are we wasting a lot of omelets, but we're all, this is also very slow. So it means that it takes so long to make the flu vaccine that by the time it's actually ready and we know what the strain of flu is that's circulating, uh-oh, the vaccine isn't very well tuned to that particular strain. And so with the mRNA vaccines, there's an opportunity, we hope, to really make a much more effective flu vaccine because you can wait until you see which virus is circulating and then you can make an mRNA vaccine quite quickly. So that, I think, will happen fairly soon. Personalized cancer vaccines, um, that's a bold idea. And those are already in clinical trials and look promising. So that's to get our own immune system to be on the lookout for mutated proteins that are present in tumors. And then in that person's particular tumor. And then this last one is much more um, conjectural. I don't know that therapeutic mRNA will really replace mutated proteins in genetic diseases. But there are about 3,000 genetic diseases in humans that have been pinned down where we know the exact cause. We know what change in the code along the DNA is giving rise to the disease. And many of these um, uh, afflict only uh, some thousands of people worldwide. So it's, it's impossible for a pharmaceutical company to uh, garner the resources to, to spend a billion dollars on, on just such a small patient population. But with the mRNA, it's possible that we could have a platform where we could make replacement proteins much more quickly and cheaply, just changing the mRNA code depending on the protein that we need to make. Well, some of you are looking at your watch and saying, it sounds like he's done talking about mRNA, and we're only halfway through the time, and you know, is that poor timing or what? But it turns out that RNA does more than act as a message, okay? So there are non-coding RNAs that don't even care about this fantastic table of the genetic code because RNA being a single-stranded nucleic acid can fold, since it doesn't have a partner strand to lock it into place, it can fold up within itself into all kinds of marvelous shapes, each of which performs a different function. And there are huge number of stories that could be told about these. But because of the time limitations, I'm going to tell three. And these are three where I have some personal connection to. So non-coding RNAs can actually be biocatalysts in our bodies. And they, uh, are called, these are called ribozymes. And they were first discovered here at CU Boulder. RNA can bestow immortality. Uh oh, now that was waking you up, right? <laughs> but at the cellular level, okay? Maybe not at the organismal level. And finally, RNA can guide the editing of the DNA. This is sort of ironic. Here, DNA has been lording it over RNA all these years, and now RNA can come in and change the code on the DNA. Uh, a technology called CRISPR. So let's start with the ribozyme story. And when I first moved to CU Boulder, I decided to set up my own lab studying pond scum. Now, why would one do this? Well, it wasn't just any old random pond scum. I was interested in this organism, Tetrahymena, which I learned about um, from Joe Gall at Yale and Jan Engberg at Copenhagen, and they had found that this organism, which is related to human biology because it has its genes in a nucleus and it does its protein synthesis in the cytoplasm outside the nucleus, so very different from a bacterial cell, more like a human cell, but a single-celled organism, 
that within this nucleus, there were 10,000 copies of a particular gene that um, helps make proteins. It helps in the process of protein synthesis. Now, most of you have how many copies of each of your genes in most of your cells? Two. Thank you. You know this, I know. So, so one from mom and one from dad, right? So 10,000 is a big deal. And if you're a biochemist, which is what I was, then you really want to have a lot of stuff to work with. So 10,000 is a lot bigger than two. And so what the gene we were working with turned out to be interrupted by a stretch of nonsense DNA called an intron. These had been found not by, these were not discovered by us. They were found by uh, Phil Sharp at MIT and a group at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York uh, just a few years before. Everybody was interested in, in how this, they didn't know how these things popped into genes. Uh, they're sort of like a commercial message interrupting your favorite film. You sort of like want, need, want to get rid of this, fast forward through it. But what the cell does uh, is to not uh, distinguish against this or discriminate against this intron when it makes RNA. It makes it the intron along with the flanking sequences. And this necessitates a new step in the expression of the, of the gene, which is to pop out the intron and rejoin the flanking useful sequences. So this is, process is called RNA splicing. And we had 10,000 genes which were pumping out RNA that had to undergo the splicing reaction. So we had a big sort of leg up on everyone else who was trying to study this process, and we decided to try to understand how this RNA splicing worked. And if you're a biochemist, the first thing you want to do is to get a reaction like this working in the test tube, again, in vitro, right, outside of the body, so you can figure out the requirements for the reaction. And the first time Art Zog in my laboratory took unspliced RNA, which still has the intron in it, the wiggly line represents the intron, and put this in a test tube with a nuclear extract. We knew this was taking place in the nuclei of the tetrahymena cells, the splicing. So we isolated the nuclei, smashed them up so that the protein enzymes that would be required for cutting and pasting this RNA would be present in the tube. We added some small molecules which are present in all cells which were necessary for the reaction. And the first time we tried this experiment, added the nuclear extract and the intron popped out. So we were seeing splicing in the test tube. No one had ever seen this before. We were ecstatic until we looked at the adjacent part of the experiment and saw that when we left out the nuclear extract, there was just as much RNA splicing. Well, this didn't seem possible and thought maybe some mistake had been made, but it was very reproducible. And um, so the surprise was that it didn't require an extract of the nuclei. So what was catalyzing then this tetrahymena RNA splicing? Well, there had to be some kind of an enzyme. And James Sumner, Cornell University, when he got his Nobel Prize, proudly announced that all enzymes are proteins in 1946. So we were looking for the protein enzyme that must be contaminating our RNA preparations to be catalyzing this fantastic reaction. Well, that hypothesis didn't go so well because we tried to shake off this hypothetical protein enzyme by uh, boiling the RNA, which is very bad for proteins, adding detergents, which proteins don't like. The splicing was unfazed. It continued. So it looked like there maybe wasn't a protein. So this brings us to a chemistry department uh, Christmas party where Paula Grabowski, my graduate student, presented me this as a, as a Christmas present. Now, fortunately, we were able to do something a little more scientific than picking off the petals of the daisy to resolve this, this question. And we did find that it was the RNA by itself that was folding up into a complex shape and was promoting or catalyzing this cutting and joining of RNA bonds. So each of these RNA molecules, the intron itself was the enzyme 
that was doing the job. And that's why we called it a ribozyme. It was a ribonucleic acid with enzymatic activity. This excited a whole community of researchers that I actually didn't even know existed. And these were people who were interested not in, in Campbell's primordial soup, but in events that must have occurred about four billion years ago on the planet Earth. And when they thought about how could the first self-reproducing, even very simple system, have gotten started by sort of random chemical reactions, I thought, boy, this is a really tough problem. It's a real chicken and the egg problem. Because if you need to have a, a molecule of heredity in order to have life, something to pass down to the next generation, well, that's DNA. But then you need something to copy the DNA. Well, that's a protein enzyme. So you really think that at the same place at the same time, by random chemical reactions, you're going to get some kind of a primitive DNA and some kind of a primitive protein enzyme as well? Well, now that we know that RNA can be both a uh, informational molecule, again, think SARS-CoV-2, uh, and also a biocatalyst, maybe at the beginning there was RNA copying itself. RNA was both the, the molecule being copied and it was the Xerox machine as well. And so maybe this RNA world was the way everything got started. And then later on, uh, proteins joined, probably very early proteins joined the, the, the game. And then much later, DNA was invented as a much more stable storehouse of genetic information. The scientific community was excited about this, that very soon Sid Altman at Yale, who did, had done uh, similar work uh, on a different system, and I shared the Nobel Prize in chemistry, and here we are uh, enjoying the party at Stockholm. I do look a bit younger in 1989 than I do now. And um, my, one of my daughters was, uh, uh, in, enjoyed the dancing and the festivities. The other one, uh, Jennifer, who's now a PhD scientist in, in Seattle, um, was too young to be allowed to come. So how about bestowing immortality? That sounds pretty important. And this brings us to another RNA that is part of a machine called telomerase. Now, I have to introduce this by um, starting out by talking a little bit about the ends of our chromosomes. Uh, they are a, a vulnerable place that need protection, much as the plastic tips on our shoelaces protect the shoelaces from fraying. What are those plastic tips called? Taglets. I always know the crossword puzzle players in our audience. Okay, so the, this, uh, the length of this DNA at the end of the chromosome turns out to be a yardstick that measures or determines how many times human cells are allowed to divide before they reach senescence, before they stop dividing. They don't die after they reach senescence. They just quit dividing, and they sit there, and they have a different uh, shape and a and, and, uh, different role. So... This, this model that the chromosome ends shrink and then the cells stop dividing uh, has been, there's a lot of evidence for that, uh, but there are exceptions. So, so uh, human somatic cells, body cells, brain, heart, bone, et cetera, they are happy to stop dividing, but stem cells uh, need to continue to proliferate to make renew, to do the renewal of skin and bone and liver cells uh, after cells get uh, damaged or, or, or die. So the way that this occurs is that their telomeres have to be extended, and this enzyme called telomerase is the one that does this. Now here's sort of a cartoon of what it looks like. I already gave you a hint that it would be carrying an RNA molecule. And what this RNA does in part is that it provides a template to tell the telomerase machine what sequence of nucleotides to lay down at the end of the chromosome. So wherever there's an A, it puts down a T. Wherever there's a C in the RNA, it puts down a G. And after it makes the six nucleotides, it ratchets back and makes another one and ratchets back and makes another one. So this extends the end of the chromosome and thereby imbues immortality at the cellular level. And 
you might think that this is a good deal for your own longevity. Uh, in fact, there are many products that are available uh, to extend your telomeres. Uh, but I must point out that these are considered food supplements, and so they have not been uh, approved by the FDA, and they have not gone through clinical trials. And there might be a reason that you wouldn't want to just willy-nilly extend your telomeres because it turns out that cancer is a, another example of cellular immortality, right? So how can cancer cells keep dividing without end? And the answer is they reactivate their telomerase. They reactivate the protein component, the TERT, which in fact was discovered here in my lab in, at, at CU Boulder by a postdoctoral fellow from Switzerland named Joachim Lingner. Now, because it turns out the telomerase RNA is already hanging out in most of our cells, but the protein is not made, and cancer cells figure out a way to make that protein. Now, it was Levi Garraway uh, and his student Franklin Wong at Harvard Medical School that figured out how this happens. And it turns out that there is a change in the regulatory region, a mutation, um, that changes just one of the nucleotide pairs in the gene upstream from where, of the actual coding region. So here are these triplet codons that are, that are encoding this telomerase uh, protein called TERT. Turns out that one change in one of these leads to a recruitment of proteins that drive the DNA to RNA uh, step in the expression of this gene. And that mutation is so powerful that 80% uh, of melanoma, et cetera, et cetera, uh, cancers around the world have stumbled into this same mutation. It's not found in the adjacent normal tissue in the cancer patient. That does not, that's unmutated. So it's something that the tumor stumbled into and it's such a powerful driver of immortality that the only tumor cells that survive in these patients are the ones that have that particular change. So 400,000 times per year around the world, melanoma tumors have independently stumbled upon this cancer-driving mutation in telomerase. Now, the last story is this one that RNA can guide genome editing. And this blank slide is to remind me to tell you that if you wrote out all of the A's, G's, C's, and T's in your, all of your chromosomes, your entire genome, in a, sort of a normal font, it would take one million pages to write out the whole human genome. That's how, that's how big uh, the sequence is. And what scientists have been looking for is sort of like a word processor program, a find a search program that could go through those million pages and find any sentence that was of interest, and then using a sort of equivalent to a find and replace on your word processing software, change a faulty sentence or a, even a faulty letter within a sentence to a correct one to fix a genetic disease. So the concept was clear. There was nothing available that could do this until uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna came along and uh, d discovered that a bacterial antiviral system called CRISPR could be repurposed to edit the human genome. And we were particularly excited about this Nobel Prize here in Boulder because Jennifer had trained in my laboratory uh, in the 1990s, and here she is at a Czech lab reunion, along with other tra former trainees who are also uh, professors uh, at the University of Chicago, the University of Washington, Seattle, and Scripps Institute, respectively. So how does this CRISPR work? Well, it's not as easy as the red scissors, okay? It does cut DNA, but it's a little more complicated than this. And the key to its success is, again, RNA, right? So it carries along with it 
a guide strand of RNA. And only when the sequence of that RNA matches one of the strands of the DNA does it lock down at that specific spot. And then a protein that comes along with the RNA, in this case called Cas9, has the ability to cut the two strands of the DNA. Well, why would cutting your DNA be exciting? Why would this be a therapeutic uh, tool or a research tool? Well, the cutting by itself really isn't. But having a break in a chromosome is such a deadly event that eons ago, all living organisms have developed ways of repairing broken DNA. And so DNA damage is just not tolerable. And one of the ways that they um, repair that breaks in the DNA is by finding a DNA with similar sequence and using it to restore the continuity of the, of the chromosome. Well, what scientists have found out is that as long as this green piece of DNA is sort of similar to the uh, normal chromosome, but you can make changes in here. And the changes, for example, could fix a sickle cell anemia mutation and revert it to the correct code, OK? So this CRISPR genome editing, which is already an outstanding research tool used in many laboratories here within this building, also has medical potential, either deleting bad genes, but particularly in the area of repairing faulty genes. We think there's enormous potential because most diseases are either genetic in origin or they have a genetic component of some sort. But at the same time, we're very cognizant about ethical uh, concerns with using this technology, right? One has to always be careful about messing with mother nature. And so it's really a societal issue. Should we ban certain uses of this powerful, albeit quite specific, gene editing technology. So what if it can be used to reduce pain and suffering? Well, there's already a consensus in the medical community and in the regulatory authorities that, that if it is safe and effective, uh, that this is an appropriate use. In fact, the first CRISPR therapy for sickle cell disease, which is uh, the bane of especially the African-American population, causes uh, crises which are extremely painful, often require uh, uh, transfusions, uh, and there has been no cure for it. Now there is a therapy that's been approved for human use. And again, we're ta I'm talking about really recent stuff, right? December, you know, two months ago, the first therapy was approved. So there's consensus that that's probably a, a, a good use, but how about enhancements. How about if we could use this gene editing technology, which I'm sure we could if we chose to, to choose the height or the musculature or the hair color of your kids? Well, there are certainly people in the, in the world who would do this, but we think this is one step in the door, one foot in the door for eugenics, and that this should, should not be uh, an, uh, uh, an approved use. How about germline editing? Editing the DNA in sperm and egg cells so that the changes we made will be passed on to future generations. Well, that sounds attractive in terms of not passing down genetic diseases to your offspring, but there's a lot of concern that if there was any mistake in the editing, that that too would be passed down. So for the time being, the uh, scientific leadership um, in, in around the world has convened and decided that this is an inappropriate use, but there may be a time when it's considered safe and effective enough to be approved. What if the advantages of CRISPR genome editing are available only in a few countries or only to the rich? Well, this is a really deep concern that many of us have. It is not, it is not just for CRISPR genome editing, right? There are a lot of high-tech medical therapies that share the same problem and I think we have to continue to work on it and try to ameliorate it. And finally, what about CRISPR-engineered plants and animals, releasing them in the environment? Well, the mankind's history 
with introducing uh, non-native species into new environments has been pretty sordid, right? And you, you all know a big list of, of things that have gone wrong. On the other hand, this is a very specific gene editing technology, and people are already thinking about using it to re-engineer coral to not bleach in warming oceans. And since a third of the protein consumed by the entire world comes from the marine environment, there may become a time when we decide that CRISPR-engineered plants and animals are uh, going to perhaps save the planet. So uh, something for you to all think about and to opine about. Uh, but in any case, in terms of RNA, uh, these are certainly three uh, amazing stories of how non-coding RNAs, in addition to the fantastic ability of RNA to encode proteins as seen in the mRNA vaccines. How about in the future? Well, there are a lot of non-coding RNAs especially that we have not yet um, looked at at all. In fact, we've hired a faculty member, John Wren, who's in the audience tonight, who specializes in these non-coding RNAs, and uh, they may have all kinds of fantastic activities in human health that we don't know about yet. So in closing, my laboratory, uh, who helped me do some of the work that I talked about tonight, thanks you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.